Good morning, hopefully you're all having a great day today. I've got a few tasks that I need to complete for a few different projects. So today's kind of a scattered day. And in the meantime, I need to keep cleaning up as I go. Uh, but first up, I'm gonna work on that board. That panel or that board belongs to this chest from the 1850s. This chest is in rough shape because of, you know, almost 200 years of, of uh, 170 years of, of abuse and use, but for 170 years, it's still structurally really, really solid. So real quick, before I get into that board, uh, this is a walnut chest, the sides are walnut, and this is a full dovetail joint on the corner. Really cool to see this because of these chests that are surviving, I don't think anybody has seen the inside, not publicly anyway. You can't find any pictures of the inside of these joints, uh, the corners, because they have steel plates around them to reinforce them. So here's how this was built, 1850s, granted. It's a full dovetail joint all the way down, top and bottom are mitered, right? And then a dovetail joint has a physical connection in one direction. That's the whole point of a dovetail joint. It's really strong in one direction, and it can't physically pull out. It's a mechanical joint. Well, the other direction, it can. You have to rely on glue or pin it in some other way. Well, this is glued and it's also pinned. We've, we've never seen this before. So the tails, every other tail has a cut nail pinning it to the tail board. So, right, so you have a mechanical connection in one way. You have split nails going in the other direction, glued together, and then there's a big piece of steel brace, iron bracing that goes around these, these corners that have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven screws into the case. So it's a really strong joint that is being protected and reinforced with a steel plate. This isn't IKEA furniture, right? This, this, is, uh, this is built to last, and as you can see, it's lasted. The only things that have deteriorated are the areas that really didn't have any protection on the bottom edges uh, where the steel plates weren't on the other side, which I don't want to show you too much of this because I am making a video on this. But anyway, it's really fascinating to see this particular joint survive this far. Uh, it's, it's, it's just really, really cool. The board that I just showed you is part of the uh, someone else's fix of the bottom panel. The bottom panel originally had three uh, white oak boards that were all have a, had a tongue joint in them, a groove joint in them with a spline in between. Well, there's only one original bottom panel surviving. The other two uh, we need to remake, but we needed to take out the pine board that was in there because pine's not according to the specifications. It needs to be white oak. Uh, it's really weird. The bottom panels are white oak. According to the contracts, the sides are walnut, the major interior divider is walnut, and all the loose interior dividers are poplar. I don't know why that is. Um, so the, the, the two pieces that we just took out, one is a large board and then there's another kind of small board. We're going to kind of keep those with this in the museum but it doesn't need to go back into the bottom. So what we're gonna do is, just like the last chest, uh, which we replaced the bottom on, the, the wider piece, I'm gonna carve a sign into it, and then the small pieces I'm gonna to use to cut as uh, footrests, I guess, to keep the sign at a slightly tilted angle. So as you walk up to it, you'll see it, and then there'll be a sign in front saying what it is. So it kind of keeps the refurbished pieces with it, you know, because it is part of this history, history of this particular chest. Uh, but that's the plan. One thing that I want to do before I put this on the CNC and carve it is get all the dirt off of it. And I want to use a, a plastic brush here, a nylon brush, to get the dirt off uh, because the dirt is what really dulls sharp edges. I don't want to dull my router bit on this. Uh, but I don't want to use like a wire brush, a metal brush, because I don't want to take this dark patina off the top. This is not, like I said, the, the correct species for this application. And to make it look a little bit darker, the, the previous owner who put this bottom panel in place burnt it all with a torch. So I don't want to take that off. I want to leave the contrast because I think that'll help the sign pop a little bit. Um, but it, it definitely needs to be cleaned.
that throws a wrench into the plan. I was going to carve this real quick on the CNC, but uh, my Windows laptop that I was using for controlling the CNC crashed. Windows, oh, I just wish everything ran on Linux. Things would be a lot easier. Um, so the laptop crashed. I had to bring my old PC back here in the shop and reinstall Windows, reinstall all the stuff that's necessary. Completely forgot that I was using a demo version of Mach 4 because it didn't transfer over my license. So now I need to go to uh, the website to transfer over the license, pro license properly and their website's down. So I imagine it won't be down for a crazy amount of time. But uh, plan B, let's be productive with something else. That something else is this big old chunk of walnut. This was cut out of a walnut slab. Uh, the, the chest that I'm working on, the center divider is just one big piece of walnut. It's crazy. The specs call for like a 14 and three quarter inch, something like that, wide single piece of walnut, exactly one inch thick that fits inside of a dado front and back. And the crazy part is at the top, there's a half inch hole drilled all the way through the board and it bolts the front and back of the chest together. Crazy, right? So especially considering this was built in 18, uh, 1850s. So, you know, of course, bit and brace, you drill halfway through either side and you meet in the middle. Uh, but I have this one large piece of walnut to do that. But look at the, look at the way that it was sawn so crazy it's i guess there's a lot of blade drift during this so this needs to be milled flat and square over the course of several days and the final milling won't take place until we actually fit it into the chest but right now whew, i want to measure that the thickest point is looks every bit of two inches the thickest point one and seven eighths the thinnest point one and three eighths looks more drastic than that Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? This is a very beautiful piece of walnut. There's some slight compression and some slight curl, slight waviness to the, to the grain here. And on one side, there's a lot of sapwood. Meh, oh, whatever. <laughs> but this side just looks awesome. So we are at 1.2, what does that thing say? 1.26 inches. I need to get down to one inch. And I still have some more material to remove here and here, as well as a little high spot right there. Uh, but this is going to sit in my shop for a couple days before I take it down any further. I want to get this down to about, I guess, one and a sixteenth. And then the final day we're ready to fit this, I'll probably use the drum sander to get it down to its final thickness. Hey, Duffy, I got a quick question for you. 
Can you hear me? Duffy. Hey, I got a quick question for you. The center panel, the center divider, uh, I started milling down because it's pretty thick, obviously, and uh, we're at about an inch and a quarter on it. But what's the final thickness on the bottom panels? Because if it's not, if it's if it's a little bit one inch, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna hold off on those then. We're 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 pretty close to one inch, so I'll hold off on those until the day we install. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that's that's all I had. Just just wanted to check the bottom panels, see if I can get started on those. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Something else that I've been meaning to do for a while, as you can see, is change the filters on this air cleaner cart. Ugh. So if you're not familiar with this, this is probably. Pro Honestly, it's probably the most used item that I've ever made, whether it's shop project or, or, or just a piece of furniture, anything. I use this on a daily basis when I'm here in the shop. Uh, when I'm cutting sawdust, this is on. Basically, the only time it's not running <laughs> is when I'm trying to record narration. Uh, so with that said, it's, it's a very compact design. There's four filters all the way around. Each one's 20 by 20. And the reason I chose that dimension is because when I made this, my previous house, the uh, air filter for the central HVAC was 20 by 20. So it's just, it was just easy. You just recycle the filters, basically. You can use them for in the house. And then after that, they migrate into this because this, I'm just trying to trap larger particles uh, for, for the shop. And then um, you just kind of work your way down. Same thing that I'm doing here in my shop. On the other side of the wall, or the other side of the shop is two, three mini split heads. Each one of those above it, I built a filter box to hold four of those filters. So when I pull one down or swap out the filters from one of them, those filters become here. So this never sees brand new filters. It's going to get full of all, all kinds of other crap anyway. Um, this is also really, really, really good for catching overspray when I spray anything, really. And uh, it's a very compact design. It's a furnace blower motor. Uh, this is used when I got it. A friend of mine gave it to me actually, and he got it from a local contractor for free. Uh, I don't know the horsepower on this. I don't know the CFM on this. I do know that it was rated as, as three different fan speeds. And I, I just put it on the lowest speed because it moves a ridiculous amount of air, even on its lowest speed. It did have a, uh, a, a tag on the motor to, for the proper amperage. And after I put it all together and restricted the airflow a little bit, I put an amp meter on the, uh, on the wires and I was within the specs, so I'm not going to burn up the motor. Something that you don't want to do is have not enough restriction of the airflow uh, and then these, these uh, just run too hot and you end up burning up the motor. One thing that I really think this does a good job, one of the reasons I think this does a really, really good job is because not only does it blow air out, but it blows air out on like a 45 degree angle. So not only if you put it on the side wall of your shop, are you circulating area or, or air around the shop? You're also circulating air top to bottom. And that does a really good job. And I've tested it with my Dylos air quality monitor. And just so long as it's on one side, it's just so long as it's not in the middle of the shop and it kind of blows around, it does a really, really good job of, of cleaning the air. Uh, so out with the old filters and in with the repurposed filters. These came down from, where did these come down from? 1-5-2020. So these were one of the first batches of filters I took down from uh, the mini splits. Way cleaner than the ones I just took out of here. Ugh. So I sent an email to support at 10.09 a.m. And at 10.17 a.m., so less than 10 minutes, I got a reply. That's good. Hello, I apologize, but you will just have to wait. I don't have a time when we will be back up, but it is being worked on. Hmm. Okay, well, no CNC stuff. I understand it. My website's going down sometimes, too. Well, unfortunately, all the work that I needed to get done today, stuff that I actually need to get done, is all CNC stuff. So, plan B, plan C, I don't know where I'm at right now. Um, I guess I can get started on this. I spun it around. This is the other side. This is the side that will 
be the top. And I think it looks great. So the other side has a big bark inclusion right here. And as you can see, it's not so much right here. So I'm gonna fill this with black epoxy once I get all the crap out of it. And it'll be focused on the wood using the epoxy as a stabilizer rather than the stabilize rather than the epoxy being like a an accent or a focal point rather. Some of these some of these epoxy tables get a little crazy. I just don't see how there won't be long-term issues with expansion and contraction with wood in an epoxy table. I don't know. Maybe there's some that are out there for long term. It just it just doesn't seem right locking a piece of wood together with epoxy. On a large scale anyway. Here's some wide stock for you. This is 20 inch wide poplar. Ugh, it's in my way. <laughs> so when you're working on a bunch of stuff at once, you just move it. And then you move it. And then you move it back. So then you can move it one more time to work on it. Back and forth and back and forth. This board is wide and it keeps adjusting to the climate in here. So every day I flip it and there's a little bit different twist or bow or something and it all keeps moving. It's crazy with something this large, you can actually see the wood movement. These sawhorses are from the apartment days, the apartment complex. You guys remember that? Two by four sawhorses. These are still, still rocking. A little wobbly, but none of them have failed on me. I've never flipped anything. It's still the original surface on top. Sawhorses. So my initial thinking was to just remove all this loose debris in the middle, the obvious stuff, and leave this this brown around it. But this is actually bark too, and it's loose. It's not connected. So all of the brown has to be removed. So we're back to the sapwood here. So this is the good side and that ended up being a much larger bark inclusion area than what I initially thought. But you know, I was expecting it to be bigger, but not that big. So that's about as much epoxy as I really want to go with. I don't want to do a full, like I said, river table or anything. So I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, I gotta pick up this mess now. And I was not expecting that much trash out of that hole. Thankfully, the Mach 4 website wasn't down too long and I was able to get my Mach 4 copy activated so I could use it and cut out the sign. This, this type of material where you have a lighter, lighter material in, in its core and a dark surface finish of some kind, it's the most fun to carve because it, it just comes to life and there's nothing that you have to do as long as you use a good quality bit like this one, there's there's zero clean out. It's just straight up cutting and what it is is what it is, right? So you don't have to do a bunch of tedious cleanup work, which is great. And here it is on a kickstand. This re replaced bottom panel was two pieces. This wider piece that the sign's made out of and then this more narrow piece uh, that I cut on the table saw to make a little kickstand. Same thing we did with the last chest we restored. Uh, that way when it's in the museum, it'll be sitting like that and the sign will be right with it. It'll probably be sitting on the ground, but 
it's nice to have a uh, a sign to go with it. And the cool fact, or the cool the cool thing about this one is, while that's not the original bottom, it it did live. 30 years, 40 years with the chest. So it's kind of part of its history. So keeping it with it, that's pretty neat. As I'm editing this video, I, I realized I forgot to shoot an outro. I stopped for lunch and did something else apparently. <laughs> uh, but let me know if you like this style video, just completely random stuff in the shop, not necessarily a project-based video, but just shop life, I guess you could say. Uh, that's it for this one. You guys take care, have a great day, and I'll talk to you in the next video.